So um, I'm uh, Simon Hathaway. I'm uh, here from Chale, and I know very little about mobile, uh, but I know quite a lot about retail, and particularly how it's impacting retail. Our first question to you guys is, how many of you guys have heard of Chale? Wow, that's not bad, actually. If I'd done that a year ago, there would have been absolutely nobody, so we are making a slight impact. Um, how many people have seen this piece of work in a Seoul subway for Tesco's? Quite better, right? We did that. Okay, Chael did that. Um, and it's an idea, I think, that started with retail and mobile that's gone everywhere. So we've seen Tesco's bring it around the world. We've seen it go to Peapod in, Ch in Chicago. The business has now gone bust as they built their business around it. It's going right through to uh, people like uh, eBay using it and even uh, uh, publishers. So Glamour magazine in the US actually used it to bring all the advertisers together in a, in a subway. So it's a simple idea that enables you to buy things through mobile. And it's an idea that's come out of Korea and, and they, where, where we come from as an agency. So I wanted to look at a few stats very quickly about Korea specifically and why that's seeing some change. So let's just quickly look at retail today in Korea. In 2012, Koreans spent 284 billion US dollars in retail. I've got no idea how much that is, but I think it's quite a lot. It's got a billion in it. Um, it was only up 1.8% after you take inflation out of it from the year before. 11.3% is the growth in online retail. So those are stats that you'll probably see pretty much everywhere in the world, right? Nobody's feeling particularly uncomfortable with that. If you want the big number, it's 29.8 billion US dollars shopping online. Interestingly, only 58.4% of Koreans shop or sell online, which feels actually quite a small number. But then we get into the stuff that we want to talk about, and mobile. So 13.8% of women in Korea actually shop on a mobile phone. That means actually make a payment on the mobile phone. It's not just searching, right? Because a lot of stuff that we see now, you know, I've laughed at that quote about people wanting their mobile banking apps to be, they're spending more time on their mobile banking apps. I mean, what a load of crap. What an absolute load of crap. I mean, the only reason to go to a mobile bank app is to find out how much money you've got to see if you can spend some more, right? That's all you would use it on your phone for. Why would you do it for anything else? Unlikely to happen, right? And that's the kind of the key thing. So anybody want to make a guess about how many men in Korea spend on their smartphone? Uh, just buy shop, do the shopping on their smartphone. Get that right eventually? More. More? Less. Less. <laughs> okay. It is actually uh, more. So 15.5% of men shop via smartphone, which is a pretty interesting number, I guess. But more interesting perhaps is that 21.9% of people in their 20s shop on their smartphone. So we've got a new generation of people coming through whose expectations are that they will be able to shop on a smartphone. As I stand uh, in an IPA event, I think the most interesting set of all there is that 42% of people in Korea shop online while watching TV. Now I thought that piece of last bit of research looked quite interesting, but what's more interesting is what they're doing also when they're using their phone or their device when they're shopping. You know, 42% of people in Korea suggest they're shopping online while watching TV. As the advertising industry, we talk about, what do we talk about this when they're watching TV? We talk about the second screen, right? What a complete load of bollocks. If you know anything about how people shop, they become completely mission focused. They want to achieve something, they want to buy something. This will be their primary screen at that moment. That has meaning in Korea, we are rethinking how we do our advertising at key shopping moments, because that is actually becoming a path to purchase communication medium. We have to really think about that. So all of this is the big change in retail. We talk about omni-channel. That's a real alignment of how retail works. A seamless approach to shopping experience through all retail channels. A mobile specifically is becoming an absolutely key channel. What I'd like to think about now is just about how, it's, uh, how that's changing our, our expectations of our experience in retail and also with brands. And I thought the presentation from the gentleman from LBI this morning was amazing because what we actually talked about there was not really how his mobile was failing him, but how his expectations of a brand experience had changed. And the real piece about all of this, particularly with mobile, is that our expectations of what our experience should be has fu have fundamentally changed. So in retail, that has been huge. Absolutely huge. And how many of you, I mean, you guys can probably all name a number of huge global brands that have failed. Now here in the UK, we've got some great big electronics retailers. Jessup's, you know, a high street only store in the world, in the, in the UK, that focused solely on cameras is no longer in existence because of the internet. 
And if you look at the numbers that I've now forgotten what it's a comet or curries or whatever, the DS Dixon Stores Group, anyway, sales have gone up 33% because their main competitor has just declined, just, just gone, right? So we've got to change. Everything has changed. It means our expectations of retail are now pretty much this. We expect retail to be everywhere because it can be. That's as far as I am from a retail environment. It has to be instant. I, mean, I sat in a meeting the other day talking about a book and somebody had bought it before the end of that meeting. It's instant. And it has to be personal. We've all worked out that cookie culture means I get personal information. I thought that for statistic about Facebook searches, you know, how personal is that? You know, when you start to bring in your uh, Facebook uh, contacts into your Bing searches, you get stuff where your friends are making personal recommendations for you. That's changing everything together. So retailers have to think about being everywhere instant and personal. But for me as a shopper, and that's really what I'm interested in, it's about here, now, and me. So looking at the how retail itself is changing, when you look at that, obviously there's a lot of stuff online, right? Everybody sits on their sofa doing shopping, they kind of do all these things. We've got people like P&G actually taking stuff out to be mobile. You've got retailers who are creating deliver anywhere apps or even building stores in new locations. You've got uh, online retailers going into uh, bricks situations. You've got pop-up retail going everywhere. Uh, this is some stuff we did for Samsung recently, which has been incredibly successful. We've even, even now got a department store, effectively, as a pop-up uh, location. We've got campaigns. That, that was a pop-up shop. We've got things like augmented reality, which enabled you to shop anyth anywhere and see different uh, levels of solution. On the instant side, you know, there's a huge amount of stuff going on where we are seeing uh, convenience being redefined. We're seeing new ways of payment, which increase the speed of purchase. Uh, we've got things like Pinterest and social situations, which enable you to click straight through from a Pinterest, something you like, straight into a retail environment, to actually get location-based data on where that's available or how it delivered straight to you. Obviously, in terms of the apps themselves, you can start to build it. We're getting a high level of segmentation. Uh, we're getting stuff which is delivered on the same day. We're seeing people start to build a level of what used to be about an editor of choice with a retailer becoming a an, an, uh, curator of choice. So we're starting to look at people and um, in our social networks, but also in our, uh, from retailers and, and specialist people who can define the content that we get in stores. And they were expecting a whole level of experience from a retail situation. And if you look at Apple particularly, one of the biggest brands in the world today, they democratise the whole of that brand through retail, right? Before that, only cool people who worked in advertising used Apple. Now everybody does. And the cool people who work in advertisers have Samsung devices instead because their grandmothers have got an Apple. Right? Or your grandfather, if you're the, uh, your father, if you're the gentleman earlier. So that's kind of where we are. I mean, we're in a situation where retail and every single idea that you look at in mobile has to deliver on those three expectations of what happens. There's everywhere, instant, and personal. What I want to do now is just take you through three case studies, which I think are quite cool, uh, from Korea, from a specific email, uh, retailer called Emart. Um, and email, Emart's a bit probably like Waitrose in the UK. But there, the challenge really is to recruit people into mobile devices. So these are three very cool campaign ideas that get you to see that sense. The first is about everywhere. Korean people are the busiest people in the world, working very long hours, which is why convenience is key when choosing a discount store. And once they find one, they rarely go anywhere else. So our mission was to get people who couldn't get to Emart to start shopping at Emart. How did we do that? By taking the store to them. So we created flying stores, Wi-Fi balloons complete with routers and floated them to every corner of the city. People were then able to connect to the balloon's free Wi-Fi signal through their smartphones before downloading discount eMart coupons, allowing them to buy products instantly through a mobile app. The result? The flying store was a runaway success and sales rocketed both online and in store. With mobile sales more than doubling and downloads of the mobile app hitting 50,000 in a single month. Can't get to Emart? We'll make sure Emart comes to you. Flying store, flying Emart. So that's a really simple idea that takes the connectivity of a mobile phone everywhere. Uh, you know, it's some quite cool technology that means that when you uh, click into Wi-Fi, as you probably all do, you go straight into their shop. 
I mean, that is a, as about as everywhere as you can get. So you can take the store to people where they're not thinking about it, where they're redefining uh, convenience. So quite a, a cool, simple thought, and I think we'll start to see this use of defined Wi-Fi spaces probably growing as, a, as a, an idea to create new experiences uh, for people. The second uh, you might have seen, um, and it's about now. So this is a real classic situation for a retailer, right? A lot of retailers have um, day part challenges. I thought it was interesting when uh, we saw those stats earlier about how many people went shopping at lunchtime. It's kind of pretty obvious, right? You've got some time off, you're going to go buy a sandwich. So uh, that's a, a key place. But for a lot of big retailers, like grocery retailers, actually there's a downtime because people are not actually on their uh, websites or, or, or doing their shopping at home. So this is a specifically targeting uh, that lunchtime period. E-Mart is the Walmart of Korea with 141 chain stores across the nation. However, E-Mart has a weakness. The sales during lunchtime decrease drastically. Mission, to increase sales during lunchtime from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Idea. Give people a unique experience, only available during lunch hours. Install a shadow QR code using the sunlight and shadow only available from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. This event is called Sunny Sale. How to. Scan the shadow QR code from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Automatically skip to the Sunny Sale mobile homepage and enjoy special offers, including a $12 coupon. Purchase items on the eMart application and they will be delivered directly to your home. People were delighted to find small lunch surprises and enjoyed shopping via their smartphones. The Sunny Sale event, starting from 13 locations, has been expanded to 36 locations in Seoul. <laughs> Result! Over 12,000 coupons have been sold. In February, eMart membership increased by 58% from the previous month. A 25% increase in sales of eMart Mall during lunch hours. And media coverage on the shadow QR code promotion over the past few months. Also, the most notable result of the sunny sale was that it made people sunny for the day. Sunny day. Sunny sale. Sunny eMart. So another quite nice idea there. I think uh, it's perhaps able to work once a year here. Um, but it also showed for me the fact that a lot of these stuff we talk about with mobile is, is really about this platform and accessibility of how we use things. But also the fact that we still need great ideas. Uh, you know, the reason that got so much uh, coverage, the reason why it won at can was because it was a great idea that actually then emotionally engaged with people. And I think sometimes it's all too easy that we look at a lot of the content and certainly the, the apps and things like that that we do, and there's a simple function. But we have to, can't forget the fact that we also need that, that point in there in terms of the idea. Um, and it also demonstrates really more than anything the fact that these things are instant. So when you look at promotion, the fact with the mobile device, it is going to be an instant piece. Um, and we can't you know, forget that and under we have to understand how that uh, help makes people help react. So the last point on here is then personal. And I think the one thing that really for everything, and it's been rammed home a couple of times in, in all of those meetings, is this is the most personal device of all. You know, we all sit there and we set them up. And, I mean, I've just kind of got a new device. I'm delighted for the fact that Google's meant it's virtually set up in exactly the same way as my last device, almost immediately. And, and I expect that. My, again, my expectations are, are much in that way. But it's also, you know, it's, it's kind of, it, it helps me navigate, it helps me do everything. It's becoming the thing that is my, you know, my remote control for my life. And we're going to see in, re in retail that doing a number of things. We're going to see it kind of becoming the, the, the tools that I use on a day-to-day -day basis to buy things, to do things, to find things. Um, and it's also going to help me shop both outside the store and inside the store. So this last uh, case is just one that shows how we are starting to think about it within the store. E-Mart, number one mart in Korea. E-Mart is branching out its mobile business. E-Mart and mobile's unexpected encounter. How would that work? Idea. An event to experience eMart's new mobile technology, eMart Sale Navigation. Let customers know the location of discounted products in a huge store through their smartphones. Technology. 
the LED lighting in eMart sends data signals to your smartphone through a lens in real time. Only by using the light, lens, and a smartphone, you receive shopping information. An application on your smartphone will let you find out where you are and where you should go. Your smartphone acts as a navigation system by communicating with the light in eMart. When you arrive at the spot for the products on sale, your smartphone receives the signal from lighting and shows you discount coupon. Let's go! What's on sale today and where? eMart held a special event for its upcoming mobile business. First, people experienced a new form of shopping with their smartphones, just like driving with a navigation system. And they could find the products on sale very easily. <laughs> Through this event, consumers are now looking forward towards eMart's new mobile business. eMart and mobile have come together to bring a new era of shopping. Smart shopping. Smart eMart. So that's a pretty straightforward, simple idea. It's the first time it's kind of been done in that way by us. Um, and I think it kind of starts to understand how people are using devices as well, particularly you know, navigation, how that comes into the store. But you can see a lot of application for that, right? We're starting with a very simple way, which is really communicating value and getting people to move to a mobile app uh, as part of their shopping process. And value will always be a, a, a key thing for retailers to think about. But it also starts to tell people about how they might start, you know, think about personalizing their shopping experience. And the, you know, there are already a number of apps out there which enable you to download things like shopping lists, to set it by stores, which enable you to run your shopping list in the, in the aisle framework of the store. But this then starts to take you to a new space of saying, okay, how do I communicate with somebody in that store environment to get my, my messages across? You know, quite clearly, from a brand perspective, there's huge opportunity in that. You know, if you're a brand in a retailer, what can you do with a tool like that where people have got a device which is live because they're using it to navigate the store to actually then deliver either messages promotionally or with offers, or even brand experiences and you know, solutions. So there's not, it's not that difficult to start then moving this into a solution-based mindset. So people are going in, traditionally shoppers will walk in and say, hey, you know, what am I going to cook for the kids tonight? You only have to take one product off the shelf and scan it, and then immediately you're guided around the rest of the store to find the rest of the food for that meal solution. And there are lots of ways that we can start to think about how that will, will develop and grow. So I've rambled on for about, I think, according to this, 17 minutes. It feels like I've talked for about 20 minutes. I think I was meant to talk for 20 minutes and give you 10, uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, so I've come up slightly early. Um, I think hopefully I've given you a good sense, though, of, of what the, uh, the view is on, on where you should be going with, with uh, retail and mobile. And I guess those big sense for me is that anything you're doing where you're looking at retailers or activating in retail, you have to understand that you've got to deliver every single time to a consumer or maybe even a shopper's expectations. And that expectation is very simple. It is everywhere instant and personal. Or if it's about the human being, which I believe everything should be targeted at, it's about here, now and me. Thank you. So have you got any questions? Brilliant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that it's really interesting to see how that's working for you. They're obviously really open to mobile and working yeah. with it in that way. And I think we get caught in our little bubble living in London that, yeah, that's all applicable here. Take that to the rest of the UK. How applicable would that be if you're in a wee village in the country or Yeah. Um, I think all of that, uh, the, the big thing is that I'm looking at Korea because I think they're technologically, technologically wise, probably three or four years ahead. And we still are in a, in a place where we have a lot of legacy issues, particularly around retailing, which means it's difficult to catch up. So you, know, you look at things like payment systems, for example, and um, a lot of those payment things are just not going to happen because of the POS systems we have here. I mean, arguably, if you want to look at advancements in mobile payments, it will be in Africa because they won't need to go through those POS systems we've had in other places. So there is a kind of a, a big legacy issue around that. Um, and obviously, then, there's a the next step is, is how people are going to move and how they're, uh, in, in that point made earlier about how difficult it is for people to change. Yes, that is going to be the next piece. But what we're seeing already is that a lot of people, once they get onto a smartphone, are using their smartphone in a shopping experience primarily for search and location by finding things. So they're still saying, I want to start looking at a store, 
Uh, where is that store? So how do I get there? So it's almost like using the sat nav on, a, on their feet to get to a location of a store. And then they're starting to look at cross uh, research. So what used to be a situation where, you know, if you look at people, things like Google's ZMOP sort of point of view, it very much says like, you know, there's this phase of search, which is driven by that kind of ZMOP, and then there's an FMOP moment. And in fact, what we're seeing now is that search is ongoing. So through, and, you know, search and research is a continuing process. And a lot of that is driven by the mobile because you can search from anywhere and get other information from anywhere. Um, and that's, I think, is, is going to be the, the next big shift that we're seeing. And then beyond that, we'll start to see people actually then buying. Uh, but you're, you're going to probably right. You know, you get into a London bubble and there's a lot of technology here. I actually live in a village in Surrey. I quite, find it quite funny because I've got absolutely shit mobile reception. It's because everybody who lives by the little village hall doesn't want another sp uh, you know, antenna in the spire. They think it's going to give them radiation challenges, but then uh, they don't get any service. What do you think is uh, a bigger barrier to bring uh, innovative technology to retail or any space here? Legacy technology or culture, culture of adoption? Um, I, don't, I think there's, a, there's going to be a culture of adoption with people. I think the real issue is, that, is cost um, and also share price. So the real challenge for, for some time has been that a lot of retailers are really trying to innovate because they understand that the city knows that they're fundamentally in a industry which is going to massively realign and change. And therefore, this, the people who are investing in those stocks uh, are looking at the ones which they really have a future. So you take Best Buy, uh, one of the, probably one of the biggest uh, retailers in the US that's always been a kind of a golden stock, is now, if you read anything, slowly dying. Right? So what are they doing to reinvent themselves? And that's, what, if you like, if you look at Tesco's, that's why they've been so brilliant up until they had to have a new CEO who had to come in and say, right, we've run out of space or whatever, and the space is now going online. They, they, they put together a strategy which is, whilst you know that first TV spot which said you can now wander around the stores like this and buy stuff, nobody used that, right? But it was in a TV spot that everybody went around and said, yeah, this is great. I can now, uh, the, the share price is going to go up like that. And most of their technology pieces have been played in that way. So I'm a little bit cynical about how those technologies are being used, either to drive share price instead of actually using usability. But the one thing we all know, I mean, we're all now in a situation where our industry is fundamentally changing, is that innovation is, is, is going it, to, it doesn't always work, right? So they've got to be seen to be playing with new ideas and new ways of working because fundamentally their business is going to transform however. And, you know, you've got people at one end of the scale saying there will be no more high street, there will be no more bricks and mortar, it will all be online. And arguably, that could be the case. There are people on the other end of the scale saying, actually, we just have to reinvent how we behave. And I think, you know, there's a whole view. If you look at particularly, you know, Asian convenience stores, there's a whole view about how that might be reapplied to a UK high street, which is probably where you actually put the customer at the heart of the experience. So I think, you know, there is a whole lot of stuff going on there. Um, as the gentleman beforehand talked about in terms of uh, change, change is going to take some time, but I think it, um, it's, it's a potentially a generational shift. If you look at how anybody in their 20s is buying stuff, probably most people in this room are buying stuff. My kids are buying stuff. It's not that far away. So it's very going to have to find a balance between innovation for investor engagement versus innovation for consumer engagement. Uh, um, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think you have to find stuff which is relevant. I mean, the point I'm saying there is that, you know, understand what an expectation is and, and how somebody is using an app. So, I mean, that's why I made the point about the, the banking app, right? Realistically, most people have probably got a banking app of some sort on their phone. They use it to check their balance. That's what it's there for. It's an on-the-go process. So it's going to be low usage at points when you need to check your balance and you've got concern over it. So understand what you're delivering against. The big thing I think is really interesting about all of this is that we, the moment, the other legacy issue is that we're just recreating uh, stuff that we already have in retail. So you know, everybody talks about the mobile coupon, but you know, arguably, do we need coupons anymore? Is there a better way of doing it? And that's what we haven't net yet worked out. I think there's a, a big change which says, you know, if we move everybody through this process of just digitising what we currently have in retail, then actually what comes next? What is the next way of, of behaving? Which I think is kind of quite interesting. And the, certainly the, the thought that a lot of uh, people are kind of being challenged by choice and too much choice. I mean, I think the second biggest search engine at the moment is uh, for shopping is uh, Amazon. Right, so how many, you know, but Amazon's got too much choice, right? So how do you therefore get to that kind of curation moment? So I think there's a kind of, there's a whole load of stuff that we, frankly, we don't know, which I think is going to be quite interesting. Yes. Sorry. Um, I just want to ask you about measurement. I mean, one of the clever things, I guess, about those ideas is that 
you can track it from first interaction all the way to the basket yeah. to purchase. But the, the bit you referred to earlier, the sort of more intangible bit about us just shopping and searching and looking at stuff online, yeah. and the link between that and actually a physical purchase in the store in two days' time or whatever. Are you seeing anything that can help join the dots between those? Um, no, not yet. I mean, and that is kind of the golden yeah. target, right? How do you link up all of those things? And um, you know, I think if we can do that, I mean, that, that would be fantastic, but it's going to require somebody, uh, you get into the privacy conversation as well, to be able to physically uh, use some form of device on here which navigates and, can, and when you go into the store you can track it in the same way. And there's a couple of things that are being quite interested to look at. So for example, there's now some, if you're familiar with eye tracker technology, there's now motion technology which enables people to, with a 3D sensor, understand when somebody makes a movement kind of like that. So at least we might know if they're going to get into a showrooming situation on a big ticket item which is going to be price checking or they're looking at some other solution. There might be a way they're messaging them. But actually knowing what's on their phone, unless you've got a kind of walled Wi-Fi solution in the store, is going to be pretty difficult. And obviously if somebody uses 3G over Wi-Fi then, you know, and is accessible, then it's, it's not, not knowable. You can't work it out. But does that place the onus then, you think, on coming up with nice little contained solutions like those ones where you are able to follow the progress of the shop. And I think, if you, well, I mean, the reason, half of the reason I show that is that, yes, is that if you've got somebody who's using an app, once they're inside your app, if you can remain loyal to that app, then you're there, hopefully, forever, and you can manage it. Uh, obviously, looking at things like that, where you could link direct payment, most of the big retailers at the moment are trying to bring all those things together. So the kind of classic Dunhumby data, linking with mobile data, linking with all their other different pieces of communication, that is the holy grail. I don't think anybody has really nailed that properly yet. And you know, certainly something like Tesco, so Dunhumby's uh, software is what, 20 years old. That's a huge investment to move that onto the next stage. I was going to ask who you think is leading the way on, on that, is anyone you in the UK that you think is particularly far ahead? Um, I think if you look at Tesco's, they are, they're clearly investing. I'm not sure if it feels, it doesn't feel like it's joined up yet. And that's their challenge, and I think that's a legacy issue. Um, uh, there's a couple of retailers around the world who I think are uh, uh, doing some quite interesting stuff. I think if Del Hay is in, uh, in Belgium, nail their next generation of software and they're kind of a much smaller player, so it's quite straightforward, then that could be quite impressive. Um, you showed us some really cool e-bot things. Any things else that you want to really cool to um, uh, The one thing that I just really like um, is uh, there's a an app called Tapestry, which was developed, I can't remember if it's developed by, it's a UK company. Uh, they did a test with Diesel, I think Diesel Part funded it. And I just think it's really interesting because it's effectively a, a I don't know if you call it an offline Pinterest, but basically it enables a shopper to wander around a store and tap an NFC enabled tab or a, or a scanner barcode and then basically just bring it into their tapestry. So you create a uh, you know, a way of bringing your own shopping list, almost like curating your own, and it's driven by diesel and fashion, so you end up with this kind of virtual piece. And I think that's going to be really interesting. I think Pinterest is fantastic looking a way, uh, way of looking at how people are shopping online and creating kind of shopping lists and what I want. And I think to enable, if Pinterest could enable that through NFC technology or, or barcode scanning to go into the store, then we've got a really interesting concept there because as you start to, as people sign in, then the opportunity, if you look at what Pinterest are doing with click through availability and all those things, that could become quite interesting because then you're combining, so probably to your point, that, that data through one single device. But yeah, Tapestry, I think it's an interesting, an interesting app, which is, uh, potentially changing the way that people shop. Thank you. Cool.